member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are, are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on, it, on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. But where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of our Lord. So I did a boot camp class on Thursday. It was a tough class. I've been a little out of it. Haven't been able to keep up as much. And I, so I, I'll own it. I struggled. And my instructor noticed that. And when we finished stretching, she had the gall, the gall, mind you, to come and tell me, you know, there's a silver sneakers class after this. <laughs> generate conflict, but that comment's getting me close here. <laughs> I, was, I don't know where that came from. I'm just going to shake that off. <laughs> conflict is the scenario when this gospel reading gets uh, brought up a lot. In fact, this Matthew 18, 15 to 17, are in the model constitution for all ELCA churches. And I went back and looked, and yep, it's in ours too. So it's in a section marked Discipline of Members. So if you see me coming at you with the constitution in my hand, you might want to turn and run the other way. But when you look at this passage narrowly, right, it's about, we think it's about conflict resolution. But when we zoom out a little bit, I think we see that it's really about something much bigger than just that. This passage gets sandwiched between two other passages. The, the one right before it is where Jesus talks about the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep to go and find the one who is lost, which I think teaches us that all people are equally valuable, that God is willing to risk everything for the sake of one. Right? So you have that that frames the beginning. After that, Jesus, or, I'm sorry, Peter goes to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive? Spoiler alert, I think that's the gospel next week. But anyway, <laughs> he says you should forgive not seven times, but 70 times seven, right? Which tells us something about this extravagant message of grace and the calling to never give up on another, right? To keep Going. So when you read that gospel smack dab between these other two, I clearly see that it's not about a community trying to shame a one or figure out how to cut out the one who disagrees with you. But the intention is about restoration. Right? It's about reconciliation for all that God loves in this world, that that reconciliation may flourish. Right? That God intends this co the community of faith to live that way of reconciliation with their lives in this world. Even look at the Old Testament passage, right? The one from Zeke. Verse 11, right? Where one of Luther's favorite verses of all where it says, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but I desire that the wicked turn and live. Right? Hope is that we, even in our sin, in our, that we would turn in faith to receive not what we deserve, but to receive what God desires for us and for the world. That even as we are bound in our own destruction, the destruction of our world, the destruction of ourselves, God has a heart and a passion for life and a penchant for healing, for that to come through the community of faith. So much so that, guess what? If you jump back into Matthew, then he says, okay, if finally the, the one won't turn back and live, then you can treat them like a Gentile and a tax collector. And you may think, yeah, there it is. But guess what? How does Jesus teach or treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Okay. That's the irony of all ironies in Matthew, right? 
that that's who Jesus hung out with. Are you catching the drift that this is God's passion for reconciliation, for wholeness? This passion that took Christ to the cross, which is probably the greatest symbol of shame and alienation and estrangement that humanity could come, could come up with. To stay there and say, even this will not be the end. But this will be the beginning of new life. Because that, dear friends, is what changes the way we live. Changes everything we do. We participate today in this day of service across the ELCA. Participate with other churches who are doing that. We concern ourselves with and our energy with another. Reaching out to a vulnerable, to extend a friendly hand to someone in our communities. That's what you already have worked to foster and encourage in this place. Even through your stewardship here, you foster this kind of faith here. Not just in the church and in the programs, but in the organizations that we, as Calvary, have pledged to support. Like, take me, right? This North Texas Giving Day, we support them with our general budget. They bring emergency distribution to someone in need. Take Mid-Cities Care Corps, which is helping come up with all kinds of projects for us, for folks to do down at this day of service. They work to preserve the well-being and independence of our most senior uh, citizens in our communities. That today we, we partner with those. Both of those organizations and many others that we pledge to support as Calvary, they do the work of walking with somebody in a crisis to restore a person to wholeness, right? To make them feel a part of a community that cares for the vulnerable, that offers support. Whether you know it or not, you support that work. When you give up yourself and your resources here to the funds here, those pledges and our support of them happen. And what you do here makes a difference of reconciliation in the community out there. Because that, I think, is the heart of what Matthew 18 is about. Does the community have the values and the convictions to shape the world to look more like the kingdom of heaven? Because that's the question that inspires our actions. What we do and what we give today. That's how we grow in faithfulness. That's what the church is called to do. How we are called to live. And we look around and we say each of us is a gift for how we work together to carry God's compassion to the broken places in this world. And to make whole what is broken. To shed light where it is dark. The community has been given what it needs most. And what I think is probably the most important verse of Matthew 18. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, Jesus says. Now that, dear people, is pure promise. Where we are gathered, Christ is present. Not that we would be in agreement or just that we would always be one of one mind so that we look good to the rest of the world. No, it's a promise of Christ's presence with us that says, when we discuss, when we discern, when we talk about what we will say, what we will do, what we will give, all of those things, all of that happens, Christ's presence is here. And the work we commit to is done with God's help. <coughs> God is present here. That's that moment that Romans talks about when we wake from sleep, when we are ready, right? We get up, we're alert, we're ready. Because if what Christ has done shapes and makes any difference in our present, then we don't delay in the work that we do. That what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. That means we know the kingdom of heaven is now. If heaven is now, and we live those heavenly principles on earth. On earth as it is in heaven, as we say in the Lord's Prayer. What we do now matters so very much. I know that Phil talked about uh, Chris Michaelis' church down in uh, Missouri City last week. Uh, he was a, a personal friend of mine and started seminary and now on his first call just outside of Houston. And they had this, this incredible... 
a disaster and his church opened their doors to the community for anybody who needed a place to stay. I think he lived there for a week, I think he said. He saw in a post that he was so tired and I had to laugh. But I, he said in this post, he says, I had no idea that being a pastor could be so exhausting. <laughs> so welcome to ministry, Chris. But he said, but he said at the end of the day, people were warm, dry, safe, and God is present, he said. And he said, it's hard to want much more than that. It'll happen. It'll happen in heart. It'll happen with Irma. It will continue to roll on in everything that we have. But God is present here in the church. And people, because of this place, are fed, cared for, and loved. That together our love becomes an act of salvation, a saving act for someone else in this world. And that day of God's salvation draws a little bit nearer than it was the day before. So remember that promise, dear friends, that everything we do, we do it in Christ's presence. And tell that story that Christ is here among us. And it's hard to want much more than that. Thanks be to God.